other than a short stay in paradise, man has always been a homeless wanderer on the earth. I was driving downtown Toronto the other day and I saw a homeless man in the freezing cold and I thought to myself, I wonder if that's how God feels when he looks down upon man's spiritual homelessness. So God looks down upon the planet and devises a plan to build a house where he and man can dwell together. You see, in the words of Anne Graham Lott in her book uh, that she recently wrote uh, called Wounded by God's People, she observes that God is not an elitist. He unlocks the front door of his home and he invites us in through the work of his son, Jesus Christ. And so when you come to the house that God is building, you discover that the front door is unlocked. And as the Bible says, whosoever will may come. I remember as a young pastor, I, we had just ordered a new sign for our church. And that was a big deal back in those days, 30 years ago. And the first thing I put on the sign was the words, all are welcome. And a gentleman in the church tore into me on Sunday morning and said, that's not true. All are not welcome. They need to come. Only, only people who come through Christ can, can come into the church. I said, hold on a second. You are right. All are not welcome. The self-righteous, the proud, the arrogant, the stubborn, and the sinful are the ones that Jesus came to save. So God is building a big house. And it's detailed for us in the book of 1 Peter. Will you come there this morning with me for a new series that we are beginning called The House That God Is Building. And I want to read the first two verses of the first chapter, and then we'll jump over to chapter 2. And this is purely an introduction to our study. My wife knows that I find the introductory message of a new series the hardest because I want to just dig into the text of the word. And, but I want to try to set the book up for you this morning and introduce you to the author and some of the major themes of the book and hopefully whet your appetite to dig into this book of 1 Peter with me. So 1 Peter chapter 1, and I want to read the first two verses. And let me remind you, as always, the reading of God's word is more important than anything I have to say about it or anything you think about it. This is the word of God. Listen by faith. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. Where do you think Peter got that, uh, that blessing that he just bestowed? I'm sure they was thinking about the appearance of Jesus Christ on the seashore after he failed the Lord because he felt grace and peace were multiplied to him. Now come over to chapter 2. Let me show you in chapter 2. I want to read verses 4 and 5. As you come to him, that is to Christ... The Greek construction here should read, as you keep coming back to him. It's speaking of a relationship and of intimacy with Christ. He's not referring to the act of salvation here, but the act of building a relationship with Jesus. That's the point of being a Christian. You're brought into relationship with Jesus, and you continue to come back to him as he, you build your relationship with him. And so he says, as you keep coming to him, notice how he describes Jesus. A living stone, rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious. You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So the text is telling us, isn't it, that God is building a big house and he's inviting mankind to be involved. We should also know that man likes to build, but he builds for different reasons. God builds to include and man builds to exclude. 
And I want you to see this morning, first of all, that mankind is a rebel builder. I told you last week from Ephesians chapter 4 that I've always been fascinated by mankind's need to build. And our propensity to creativity is a mark of the, the image of God upon our souls. But mankind is also notorious for building, for using his building skills to exclude and to blaspheme God. So mankind likes to use his hands to build something, to exclude others, and to blaspheme God. Because in our rebellion, we are hell-bent on blaspheming God and building a kingdom for ourselves. I know that because in Genesis chapter 10 and 11, we encounter one of the first recorded acts of man's building plans. Do you remember the story? We're introduced there to a famous king whose name was Nimrod. Aren't you glad you don't have that name? Most Bible scholars agree that uh, the kingdom that he ruled over, Shinar, is an early reference to the beginning of the nation of Babylon. And the first project of man was an act of rebellion against God. In fact, Nimrod's name means, we shall rebel, which perfectly characterizes the heart of man in this first building project recorded in Genesis 10 and 11. Do you remember the tower that man said would reach all the way to the sky? God was reading the rebellious spirit of men who were snubbing him and excluding him. And of course, he came down to confound the languages of mankind in response to his rebellion. You see, we are hell-bent on rebellion against God and even our building projects demonstrate our rebellious nature. So remember Nimrod. But think also of someone much later in the scriptures who had the same propensity to demonstrate his rebellion against God in his building plans. His name is Nebuchadnezzar. And in Daniel chapter 4, in verse number 30, we're told that Nebuchadnezzar said, listen carefully, is not this the great Babylon which I have built by my mighty power as a royal residence for the glory of my own majesty? So Nebuchadnezzar is an example of mankind building for the purpose of excluding God. Let me remind you, though, that God's heart is to build a house and a kingdom to which he invites all of us to come for forgiveness of sins and a sense of security and for the need of belonging. Do you mind if I go back to the book I mentioned a moment ago by Anne Graham Lotz, Wounded by God's People. April and I just bought it. We're reading it with great benefit to us. Wounded by God's People in which she says, God is not an elitist. God isn't building a club where only the self-righteous can come. He's opened the front doors of his big house for sinners who are thirsty for the true God to come and receive his love and acceptance. So think about Nimrod. Think about Nebuchadnezzar. Think about King Herod. Recorded in Acts chapter 12, we're told that Herod put on his royal robes and he came out to speak to the people. And the people started shouting, the voice of a God, the voice of a God, and not of a man. You know, don't you, from history, that King Herod was renowned for his ginormous building program. He built palaces, built buildings, enormous buildings, to glorify himself. And when the people heard him, they shouted, the voice of a God, and not the voice of a man, and instantly God destroyed him. I'm simply trying to underscore for you that man is determined to build his own kingdom from which he excludes God and blasphemes the living God. I want you to see, number two, that the cornerstone of God's building is Jesus Christ. The cornerstone of God's building, the big house that he's building, is Jesus Christ. You remember, don't you, that Peter, that Jesus, excuse me, revealed to Peter that he too, that is Jesus, was also a builder. We like to think of Jesus as the sovereign savior. He is the Lord. He is the great shepherd. He is the great forgiver of our sins. He is. But Jesus himself very early on revealed that he came as a builder to erect a kingdom for the glory of God. 
and for the good of man. So at, at his own heart, Jesus is a builder, and he is the chief cornerstone of the building that God is erecting. I can't help but wonder if, he didn't, if Jesus didn't hint at his plan when he first met Peter. Do you remember? Peter, the first word of the book. Do you remember when Jesus first met Peter? It's recorded in John chapter 1. It's a fascinating, it's a brief story, but it's a fascinating story. When Jesus saw Peter, the, the Bible actually says he looked at him as if to size him up. And he said, you are Simon, but from now on you shall be Cephas, Peter. Which means, we'll talk about it more in a moment, but a fragment from a larger rock. So Jesus is already revealing his plan, isn't he? Even in the calling and naming of Peter, Jesus is saying, I'm going to build a great house for God, a great Ephesus, and you will be one of the living stones in my plan. We're not exactly sure if that's his intention in John chapter 1, but we do know that it comes later. So Jesus comes along as the cornerstone of God's building because God's building rests on the chief cornerstone of Jesus Christ. It's a common theme in the New Testament, isn't it? Paul takes this idea in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and he says that the foundation of the church has been laid and that foundation is who? Thank you. That foundation is who? That found, you, can do, you can do better than that. That foundation is who? It's Jesus. Paul says no other foundation can be laid than the one that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Peter then takes that image, and he says not only is Christ the foundation, but he is the cornerstone in the great edifice that God is building. Because the foundation of the church is that massive living rock, the Son of God seen in his deity and acknowledged by Peter. So mankind determines to build for a very different reason than God does. God comes along and he says that my very heart is a desire to build a house to which I welcome sinful man to receive the forgiveness of sins and a sense of belonging that he longs for in his life. The, one of the reasons that I'm drawn to the book of 1 Peter is because of its author. The man Peter, that's my third point. God is building with very rough and raw material. If you know anything about Peter, you know that he is definitely one of the most illustrious shining lights in all of the New Testament. He's a key player in the work of the gospel in the first century. But he's also an illustration of a man in his raw state who has had a propensity to stick his foot in his mouth. But remember in John 1 and Matthew chapter 16, that Jesus looked at Peter and said, your name will become The Rock. For those of you who appreciate the well-known actor The Rock, Dwayne Johnson, the fact of the matter is Peter was the first rock in the first century. So said Jesus. He said, your name from now on will be The Little Rock. And you will be a living stone in the edifice that I am going to build. I am thrilled and encouraged that Jesus chose Peter. Because he's the most unlikely candidate in the first century to become the influential leader of the church. As he did. See, a study in the book of 1 Peter should bring encouragement to every one of us. That in our raw state, God sees us and knows us and loves us. And he has a plan to work out in our lives as we work with him, as we walk with him. Let me just remind you about that famous encounter in Matthew chapter 16. When Jesus asked the disciples, having heard that men were talking about his identity. And Jesus said to the disciples, who do you say that I am? Peter is the one who said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God, who is to come. Jesus turned to Peter and said, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. This has come as a divine revelation from God, the Father. And you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. And I will give you the gates of the kingdom. 
And whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you bind in heaven shall be bound on earth. That famous statement is when Peter was called by Jesus explicitly a rock. Let me just remind you that he uses two words in this text for the rock. The first one used for Peter means a detached but large fragment of a rock. That's the word Cephas or Peter. Jesus was telling Peter he had big plans for him. I think that's pretty cool. This man who was prone to be strong in the flesh, to do his own thing, who was arrogant in himself, who had a proclivity to mess things up, God says, I have a big plan for your life. I just think that ought to encourage your heart. But then, of course, he says, and upon this rock, the word rock, the second word there means a massive living rock. What's he talking about? He's talking about himself. The revelation about himself that came from the Father to Peter. So Peter is a large but fragmented part of the rock. What rock is he talking about? Himself, the large, living, massive rock of his own life. I hope you're hearing what I'm trying to say to you. God created you, and your makeup is determined by him at birth. And even when you become a Christian, he's going to use your basic personality and the program and plan that he has for your life. God came to redeem you, to give you a new nature. But in your basic created form as a human being, that was God's design. That's his mark upon your life. And he's every intention of using you. So if before you became a Christian, you didn't like to be around a bunch of other people, probably when you become a Christian, you're still going to dread being in a big party where a lot of other people are around. If you're a bookworm before you become a Christian, you'll probably be a bookworm after you become a Christian. It'll just be redeemed for the glory of God because God designed you for a particular purpose upon the earth and he's going to redeem you by grace. But the story of Peter also tells us that we are not yet everything that God wants us to be. There's more work for God to do in every one of our lives. In fact, I think that is one of the key characteristics of Peter's life. When I was a young Christian, our pastor used to emphasize 2 Peter chapter 3, verse number 18. And every once in a while, he'd give me a good book to read, a good study book or a good popular Christian book, and he'd assign it to me to read, and he would sign, Love, Steve, 2 Peter 3.18. And it became a theme of my life as a young Christian. But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Because it was the theme of Peter's life. He realized that Jesus chose him as a raw pagan man to be redeemed by his grace and to transform him more and more into the image of Jesus Christ. I hope you're encouraged because you're not at all everything God wants you to be. He knows it and you know it. But the thrill of being a Christian is that God doesn't toss you aside. He works with you in spiritual development so that you even notice the changes that he is bringing in your life. Hey, I want to take a minute and have you meet Pete. I want you to know the author of the book. And I'm going to throw a bunch of words at you that I think describe some of the main themes of Peter's life. See if you can keep up with me. Write these down, will you? He was a fisherman. I don't mean to impugn fishermen by saying this, but they're really not that influential, are they? If you're planning a movement that will change the world, you're probably not going to go to a Capernaum fishing village, as Jesus did, to call Peter to follow him. It's just a reminder that Paul said, God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. By the way, I grew up in the Maritimes, known for its wonderful catch of fish. People in Ontario don't have a clue what fresh fish tastes like. I don't mean any insult, but it's the truth. And some of the richest people in the Maritimes have been fishermen. <laughs> you can get very rich fishing, you know. But a, a fisherman isn't that rich. It's just a reminder that Peter was chosen not because of anything magnificent in himself that God saw, but because of what Jesus... Are you tracking with me, church family? Yeah. 
I lost you because I'm standing up here this morning. Listen, listen, it's not because of anything great that Jesus saw in Peter. In fact, it was the opposite. In himself, Peter could achieve nothing, but it was what Jesus knew by his grace he could accomplish in Peter's life. It's true of you, too. He was not only a fisherman, he was a follower. As great as the man was, he was called in the early days of his Christianity. Jesus said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. That first invitation became the first great, great lesson of his spiritual life. And that is that you must, it's not about your abilities. It's about who you follow. God didn't take stock of what you could and couldn't do when he saved you. He took stock of his grace that would transform little old you, a fisherman, some of us would say, less than a fisherman, so that he could magnify his grace. The word first jumped out at me when I thought about Peter. He was a fisherman, he was a follower, he was first. He had to be number one in everything he did. He was the first to step up, open his mouth, and speak out of turn. Uh, I can relate to Peter. Left to myself, I want to be first in line, noticed, applauded, and congratulated. I want everyone to see what I've done in the flesh. What are you looking at me so pitifully for? So do you. <laughs> so do you. Because it's the old nature, isn't it? Peter was favored. He, along with James and John, were given some of the greatest privileges of those disciples, even in the early days of following Jesus Christ. He was present when Jairus' daughter was raised from the dead. He was, he, was, he was present when Jesus was transfigured before their very eyes into his glorious state, and Moses and Elijah came and talked. Peter was there. Peter was given the great revelation of God Almighty about who Jesus was. You know what God intends for us to learn? Privilege and favor doesn't give you any advantage in the spiritual life. Just because you grew up in the church doesn't mean you know any more than anybody else. Or you're living the kind of life God wants you. Just because you grew up in the shadow of Bible teaching, hearing the finest teachers of God's word, does not guarantee... You know why? Because your heart needs to be changed by another force and power other than yourself... Peter was fooled, wasn't he, by the enemy. He was a fool. Jesus turned to his beloved disciple, really, historically, as far as we can tell, not long after his great confession. And he said to him, get behind me, Satan. So even the greatest and strongest men like Peter, who are recipients of great privileges from Jesus, can be duped by the enemy and misled by the powers of darkness. Peter was a fighter. God was going to redeem his desire, his ability, his courage to fight. See, the problem was Peter thought he could fight his way out with the sword. He drew it out in the garden and sliced off the ear of the high priest's servant. Jesus said, put your sword away. He's trying to teach him and us the lesson. You cannot win spiritual battles with physical means. They must be won by spiritual effort and spiritual engagement. And Peter learned that if he's going to be a fighter, he had to fight by the power of the Spirit. This one stood out to me. He was a failure, wasn't he? Peter failed big time. How would you like your biggest failure to be recorded in a book that would be published for all people of all time to read? That's exactly what happened to Peter. Because it was so important that God, that, that you see that God planned, oh, I'm going to get into trouble. Peter's failure was not final. It was predicted by Jesus. And he just as surely will predict your failure until you come to an end of yourself and begin to learn to rely upon the power of the Holy Spirit and walk in the, in the strength of his grace and be the kind of man or woman that he designed by his means to be. So Peter ended up in a major failure. Are you tracking with me? I'm throwing words at you that tell the story of Peter's life. And I couldn't wait to get to this next one. He was forgiven. Jesus singled Peter out after his resurrection to find him, to say, it's all under the blood. You are forgiven, man. Now pick up the pieces and carry on with the work that I have given you to do. 
Jesus, Jesus asked for a private audience with Peter because his heart was broken. And he didn't think he could go on. He was going back to his old profession of fishing. Jesus met him and restored him. Somebody sitting in this room this morning needs to be forgiven. And Jesus will have a private audience with you. And the Bible says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We come into the very presence of this massive living rock called Jesus Christ and tell him that we regret our sins, we admit our sins, we confess our sins, and he says it's done. Don't ever bring it up again. It's been buried in the deepest sea. My last word is simply Peter the Force. He starts out as a simple fisherman, went through a massive spiritual transformation under the tutelage of Jesus Christ, the great Lord of the church, and he became one of the strongest forces for the gospel in the first century and for all time. So that's Peter the man. I hope you're still with me, church family. Let me talk to you about Peter the writer. This simple fisherman was so burdened for his brothers and sisters who were following Christ and under great pressure that he reached for his pen and started detailing some of his warmest and greatest memories as a disciple of Jesus Christ so that they would be encouraged and transformed just as he was in his own experience and his own life. Peter's letter is full of picturesque similes some of my favorite in all the Bible appear in the book of First Peter. They're metaphors to describe who we are as mankind and as God's children. Do you remember some of them? He says in the second chapter that we're like sheep going stray. Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. I'm just like a stupid sheep. I know where I should go and who I should be following, but I wander off and do my own thing. Peter says, I understand that. Let me give you the solution to your wandering heart. In the second chapter, he calls us newborn babies, <laughs> like newborn babies, babies desire the sincere milk of the word. I just love watching babies. As soon as they see the bottle, right, they start reaching. They pucker up. You stick that bottle in their mouth and off they go. Peter said, you should be like that if you tasted the Lord's goodness. There should be a spiritual hunger in you that makes you look like a little baby sucking on a bottle. Peter has some vivid images of what it means to be a Christian. In the first chapter, he calls us obedient children. Chapter 2, he calls us strangers and pilgrims. We're going to park on that one, maybe for a couple of Sundays. Because I'm feeling increasingly not at home in Canada, in the world. More and more this place feels like a dark, strange place to live where the God we have loved and served and honored is excluded. Man's building plan is to snub God, to build a kingdom of this world that denies his existence and forces him out. Peter says, get used to being a stranger and a pilgrim. As a Christian, do you ever feel out of place at work? Do you ever feel that you don't quite fit in at lunch when everyone's telling their dirty jokes and every second word is a cuss word, a nasty word? You just don't fit. Peter says, I understand that. Let me tell you how God taught me to live with joy in a place of darkness, in a wilderness world. He calls us servants of God, and he calls us good stewards, and he calls us living stones. So Peter was quite a writer, wasn't he? He talks extensively about suffering. Ten times in his letters, he refers to suffering. He also takes two key passages and talks about temptations and trials. How am I supposed to react? How am I supposed to respond when I'm under trial and I'm experiencing temptation? Peter deals with it, doesn't he? Forever seared in his conscience was that moment when a little maiden girl looked up and said, I, I recognize your Galilean accent. 
Peter knew he was tempted in that moment. He knew he had promised Jesus that he would not deny him. And there was a moral struggle going on in his heart. And he succumbed to the temptation and denied his Lord. And his heart was broken and he wept bitterly. Peter is the right one to talk to us about how to deal with trials and temptations. But the key to understanding the book of 1 Peter is in the first chapter in verse number 15. Will you look at it? You know this text. Many of you don't even have to look. As he who has called you is holy, so be ye holy in all of your, watch this, in all of your conduct. Peter's going to use that word 11 times. You say, big deal. Well, it's a big deal because the word only appears 24 times in all of the New Testament. So Peter uses almost half of their occurrences. Because Peter is saying, I understand the pressure you're under. I understand that the world is a wilderness existence, is a spiritual, spiritually dark place. But I want to talk to you about your conduct, how you behave. So this is not going to be a series of messages about do's and don'ts. But it is going to be a message that confronts you between the eyes. Head on. With the fact that if you profess to be a Christian, you better see holiness growing in the conduct of your life. Or you cannot continue to claim to be a Christian. As he who has called you is holy. Listen, so be holy in all. In all of your conduct. God is not satisfied with one of your bad habits. God will not tolerate a single excuse from us that we make for ourselves about why we mistreat others. Why we look down our nose at others. God won't accept any excuses. Peter says, I'm writing to transform your conduct into the image of Jesus Christ. So I'm attracted to the book. He has several important themes but our time is gone. Church family, you tracking with me? I still have you? Good, because I only have one last point. And it is a pretty thrilling point in this, in this study. Number four, we are living stones in God's building program. Hey, we've, we've learned that mankind is a rebel builder. And left to ourselves, we will build kingdoms that exclude and blaspheme God. Jesus Christ comes along and presents himself as the massive living stone upon which the church would be built. But he says to Peter, I've chosen you as a living stone, as a part of the building materials that I will use for erecting my church in the world. Isn't that exciting? Thank God for Peter. Yay, Peter! I appreciate Peter! But this book is going to tell us in chapter 2, all Christians are living stones in the body of Christ. So I get excited that Jesus is the foundation stone. Peter is a living stone. But I am staring in the faces of organic material that God Almighty says he has sanctified for the completion of his building project in the world. If you don't have any purpose and meaning in your life, you don't understand the calling of the Christian. Our passion and energy is to figure out what God has planned for us in his building program. And if I can help you get to the place where you understand why God put you in his body, it will transform the way you live and the force and effect of your life in a dark culture. So here's what Peter's simply trying to tell us. We are a chip off the big rock. I don't mean to be trite. As a little boy, six years of age, my dad was killed in an automobile accident, and I grew up in a small village, and every once in a while, someone would say, Oh, Derek, you remind me of your daddy. And my head would swell, my sh I'd throw my shoulders back, and I'd think, he was a good man. I want to be like my daddy. Then I became a Christian. Started reading the life of Peter and the book of 1 Peter. And I found out that I am a chip off the big rock. And if being a son of Wendell Bartlett gives me joy, the thought of being a son of the living God, a part of his building program, should absolutely explode my heart with joy, with passion, and with purpose.
Peter's going to remind us that God is building a great spiritual house with believers as living stones who are identified as holy priests offering acceptable spiritual sacrifices to God through Jesus Christ. That's the summary of his book and of God's purpose. My conclusion is so easy. The first question is, are you in the big house? God's house. Jesus laid the foundation of God's big house by laying down his life at the cross. And our entrance into God's house is through the cross, through Jesus Christ. Are you in? Do you know you're in? Have you taken the place God has for you? Are you hearing his call to join the family? The second question is simply, are you growing as a Christian? If you're in the house, you should be growing. So says Peter. And you grow by primar primarily two means. You learn how to develop an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ for yourself. You read, you pray, you meditate, you walk with God. You work out his presence in your life. You, you talk to him and you listen for him to speak to you from his word. And you're following in his footsteps. You say, that's great, I love it. I love doing things on my own. That's not the point at all. If you're not in a small group, where in the fellowship of a spiritual community that is studying the scriptures, you cannot be growing the way God intended you to grow. Of course he wants you to learn, study, and read the Bible for yourself. But he wants you to be in the community of believers in small groups. Are you in and are you in a small group? And then thirdly and lastly, simply, are you serving? Listen, you're a living stone. And you're becoming a fossil. If you're not serving, you're becoming a dead fossil. Get off your duff and use the spiritual gift God has given you. That gift may be ministering to the homeless in downtown Toronto. That gift may be leading a small group. That gift may be singing from this platform. This gift, that gift may be preaching in another church. <laughs> Not this one. <laughs> that, gift, that gift can be as creative as God is creative. But if you're not using it, you're not a living stone, you're a dying stone. And God wants you to live. God wants you to live. Do you want to live with the abundant life he has for you? Please pray with me as we finish our study this morning. Father, only you know the hearts of all men. You can take this book, your word, and turn it like a giant searchlight upon every heart revealing its true condition to the observer. And I pray that people will hear your verdict, your, your word in their hearts today. For those who are not in your big house, Spirit of God, draw them to salvation. For those who are not in a small group, motivate them that this year will be a year of spiritual growth as never before. And for those who are not using their gift granted to you by grace, granted by you, by grace, I pray that they will be motivated to become a dynamic living stone in the big house that you are building. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.